Greetings everyone and welcome to another episode of Two Docs and a Grunt. My name is Luis Fonseca, uh, retired hospital corpsman, uh, served 22 years uh, in the U.S. Navy as a hospital corpsman and uh, was subsequently awarded the Navy Cross for my actions uh, during the Iraq uh, invasion. Uh, so I'm doc number one. And, um, Nate Emery, um, retired Marine Mustang, uh, 22 years in the Marine Corps, uh, 12 years enlisted and 10 officer. And uh, off to you, Doc Berry. I'm Doc, T doc number two, uh, Andrew Berry, also known as Doc Berry. I'm a psychologist and psychoanalyst. And I practice in NISCU in New York, and I specialize in working with vets and first responders uh, dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder. And joining us for tonight's ordeal, I mean uh, fascinating discussion, um, is Captain Aaron Kelly of uh, Colony EMS. I've known her for a few years now. Um, she and I know a lot of the same people, and when I am speaking with first responders in, uh, in my practice, I hear quite a lot about uh, what's going on in the fire service, uh, EMS, uh, and, and law enforcement. And Erin has been, according to her, with Colony EMS for over half her life. And Erin, why don't you do a more nuanced intro at this point? Since I tipped my hand that I had been there for half my life, you'll know my age when I say that I've been doing this for almost 19 years now. Um, I started right out of high school. I was still eight, just 18 when I joined Colony EMS. Um, I got my EMT certificate in December of 2003. I became a paramedic in August of 2005. Um, when I met Doc Barry, I was in fact the captain. I have since been promoted to assistant chief, and my current title is now deputy chief. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, it's Congratulations. Been, it's been some time since you were in my EMT class, or I was actually getting my teaching certificate when I taught your class, so um, I've been teaching for as long as you've been an EMT, or been involved in teaching for as long as that time. Well, you, since uh, you got into this just out of high school, what drew you to EMS to begin with? Um, as Bob Ross would say, it was a happy little accident. I was supposed to be in, um, well, I was an exchange student for my senior year, so I didn't do the normal apply to colleges when I was supposed to. I did get instantly accepted to Hudson Valley, and the program that I got accepted to was the physician <clears throat> assistant program. At the time, it was um, a two-year, very intensive certificate program offered through Albany Med. Um, however, Albany Med decided to make it a master's degree program and pulled it out of the Hudson Valley curriculum. So. They offered me a position in the paramedic program. I don't think I knew what a paramedic was or an EMT did, and the rest is history. What made you stay with it for as long as you have? Um, I like the pace of it. I generally don't consider myself a people person, but I do enjoy, you know, kind of the nuanced relationship that you build with a patient in an emergency setting. Um, now that I have a nine to five position, I'm glad that that was not my entire career. I know I have a lot more years to go, but um, you know, the nine to five thing wasn't really appealing to me at first. So. Well, you get tired enough and then it becomes appealing. Yeah. <laughs> Well, here's, here's a question for you. You brought up a, point, a good point. One of the guys I served with at the firehouse said something that stuck with me five years ago, whenever it was. He says, as an EMT, I, I find that I spend most of my time calming people down. Mm -hmm. That stuck with me. Comment on that, maybe? Um, when I do teach classes, I do kind of preface the career with 
or customer this customer service aspect of it as you know this is everybody's emergency everybody that calls you whether they stub their toe or they cut their arm off it is their emergency and you have to appreciate that even if you don't understand why um, and I think perhaps part of the reason why first responders you know do get burned out or um, kind of suffer later in their careers is compassion fatigue. You spend a lot of time trying to figure out why this person is so upset and trying to relate to that and after a while you just can't relate anymore or it gets harder to relate. Okay. Um, one of the, th did you want to jump in Louise? I heard, okay go ahead jump 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 yeah, please. So don't let me answer, ask all the questions. Come on, man. Um, so, Aaron, with the whole compassion fatigue, um, that's a, a, a great, I guess, comment. Um, I've never thought of it that way. Um, do you think, like we say, it, it gets harder to relate to them? Um, is it, do you think it's because after so many, because it's, you know, mixed in with the trauma you know they're you, like you said you responded like stub toes but you also respond to you know major accidents um at sometimes you're there while family members are grieving you know why you guys have called you know uh them you know dead on the scene for, you know mm -hmm. um so would you think that some of that um getting harder to relate to your patients and or customers however you want to describe them is um a little bit as well, maybe a barrier that we all put up to, I, I, think I guess, you have not to. get emotionally evolved. Yeah, I, I think you have to. I think you have to, for and for me anyway, I'm only, I can only really speak for myself. I, I am at times a little overly empathetic. You know, I, I do want to help anybody and everybody, you know, outside of work, if somebody cries, I start to cry. Um, and I've always been that way, so I can't really relate that. I can't blame that on my career but you do have to be able to um, perform the task at hand and you know I think that kind of I don't want to say that that builds the wall but it, it does allow you to focus on what's important rather than what is the crisis um, and because it, it can't be your crisis while you're trying to also solve a problem. You can't be the hero and the victim at the same time. So you have to really be able to differentiate between what's important and how you feel about it. No, I, I can definitely understand that. Um, one thing that we say, in, you know, I guess in the paramedic world is the same kind of the same concept. Um, in the corner world, especially in the, in the trauma world, right? We always talk about that's your patient's emergency not yours so why are you freaking out you need to take a breath calm yourself down because you going into an emergency state is not going to help your patient out to understand right. that no, as far as far as the empathy thing goes i got a i got a question for you being a 24 7 empath with patients in other words the accidents that we respond to the calls and whatnot people we don't know how, if it's okay to ask, how ha, have you ever gone on a call where it's somebody you do know, like one of the brothers or sisters, brother or sister first responders, who's the one who's down on the deck? Have you ever done anything like that? How does that affect you? Um, I, I have, thankfully, not many that were um, critically ill. Um, one was a was a other first responder but we you know we only had a professional relationship it wasn't written you know, we weren't really close um and that that was a tragedy um but again it, it's it when you when you focus on the task at hand um you can appreciate that it's more difficult because you you do work with this person and you, and you you know are close that way but um I think it makes you kind of work a little bit harder, honestly, because now you, you know, they know what to expect, so you have to perform that much more because mm -hmm. they know how it's supposed to be done and, and they expect a little bit more from you. So I don't know that it, it's more of a compassion um, 
or a, an emotional thing. It's more of a performance anxiety when it's somebody that you know, as far as I'm concerned. You kind of don't want to don't want to miss anything or right, or, right. Yeah, have any missteps and and then have them see that happen. Yeah, you said something earlier, Aaron, um, and it's what uh, Doc Fonseca had brought up too. It reminded me of a conversation that um, we had had. Well, the three of us, you know, the two dogs and the grunt, when we were down in Williamsburg eating dinner, and um, Luis had, and uh, and his wife had mentioned about you know how sometimes some people have trouble um, showing empathy, like when it's their own family members or something, because they're so used to you know being in that state of like, okay, well, what's important now isn't the fact that we're bleeding everywhere; it's me trying to stop this bleeding and stuff mm -hmm. like that, and it's. Um, I'd never thought about the. So I've heard people talk about the um, compassion exhaustion, and, but I always was thinking of it as you know when you when you start to get too much into what's happening in their life and stuff like that. I hadn't considered it with even coming across as the way you react to something. So it's kind of seems like a weird balance, right? It's like you yeah. want to be. You don't want to feel like you're a robot in front of them. But you also can't afford to be like Louis said. You can't be in it with them at the same time. And I would imagine it's like how do you, how do you make that switch? You know, when you come home and close the door to, to be in the regular person, you know, that it's gonna feel stuff. And you find that difficult to do. And I I can't speak on a personal level. You know, I don't. Um, I can imagine and kn knowing what I know about. Uh, outside relationships from work and first responders. Um, I can only imagine that after 12 hours or more, depending on how you work or how many jobs you have, um, dealing with everybody else's crisis only to come home and find, you know, the dishes still in the sink or, you know, a toy broken and a complete meltdown. Like that, that has to be the straw that, you know, breaks the proverbial camel's back every so often. <laughs> yeah. Or, you know, or there's, there's times I, there's times when I come home and you know my dog wants to play and I'm like I can't I just need to sit down for an hour you know I, I just can't right now and thankfully she understands but <laughs> that's the nice thing about the dogs is they never talk back to you True. the dog in question by the way for our studio audience uh, members just so happens to be the nicest sweetest Doberman Pinscher I have ever met in my life who is more interested in sitting all over me and washing my face than guarding and so on and so forth. Very therapeutic and yet at the same time maybe a little overwhelming I would imagine. She is definitely very, um, that's her tugging on the table right now to try and get my attention, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> she knows I'm talking She probably about hears it. my, yeah she, yeah, she hears my voice in the background. It's like, hey, it's the back rub guy, where is he? But, um, um, but she one is, of the things. She, sorry. Go ahead. It's your show. Go no, ahead. I, I was going to say she is, um, and one of the ways that I've kind of gotten involved in a lot of um, this first responder wellness and, and awareness is um, she did a lot of training with Operation at Ease in um, mm -hmm. Glenville, Scotia. And um, I don't know if you guys know Joni or not, but she's actually. Does all I know you, you 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 explain the operation at ease for for everybody um, so operation at ease um, started as a non-for-profit to rescue dogs and train them for free to be service animals to um, veterans who need it they do, and light service work as well um, in the past two three years Joni has opened it up to first responders as well so anybody who needs a service animal support animal, um, can go through that organization and get one for free. All of the training is free, the dog is free, everything is free, and the companionship and service is priceless. So Grace is a oh, graduate yeah. of um, the training school that they offer. Um, thanks to COVID, we didn't really finish all of our testing as far as therapy dog, but she does. She is trained to do that. She's just not certified yet. And she comes to work with me all the time. One of us have to get the link to put that on when we broadcast this. What'd you say, Louise? 
Uh, so we'll definitely have to get the link so we can uh, put it on when we broadcast this to that nonprofit. Mm -hmm. That's not a bad idea. idea. Yeah, I can hear you. You're saying put it, put Operation at ease on this on this podcast and get the word out. Great yeah, idea. Yeah, for sure. Put the link Smooth. On Smooth. Whatever else, and Aaron, you, you, you mentioned something about um, you're really involved with uh, first responders, uh, wellness, and health. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more on exactly on what you're involved with? Um, especially since during COVID, um, again, I can only kind of speak for, for my experience with it, but I think we all, in all of healthcare and kind of across the board, emergency services kind of came out of COVID existentially exhausted and um you know i noticed it a lot in our in our folk um just you know general grumpiness and kind of just burned out we are short staffed we're having people work more than ever we have mandated people to work more than ever um there's more calls than ever it's just everything is more and more and more and less and less people to do it and it's it's kind of at a, a a crux of what we're doing. So, in my position now, and in, in the past year, you know, I've kind of um, made it. I don't want to say my mission, but I've, I've definitely taken more, paid more attention to how people are, are doing in that regard. Um, in May, we did a whole mental health awareness month and kind of geared it towards first responders, which is how we had Doc Barry come in and give that presentation. Um, that is on YouTube, and um, we currently got a grant from New York State Suicide Prevention Coalition um, called the CARES Up Grant, and we're working with them to develop resources and plans to make mental health and um, make, make mental health a priority in, in our department and first responders in, in general. So it's a work in progress, but we're talking about it. So that's it certainly goes a long way to removing yeah. the stigma. But yeah, so um, that first step is always that, you know, it's all you have to take is that first step. And like you said, you know, we're talking about it, we're getting the word out, and we're um, like Doc Barry's trying to say right now, and I keep interrupting them. <laughs> you know, it helps remove that negative stigma. So, well, well one thing I've you know, heard I categorically is, is that. We'll, when they come in and finally see me, most of them say this is the hardest thing I've ever done in my life to, to make the call and ask for help. And it's the way we're trained to do this, to think of everybody else first and ourselves absolutely last. And if we find ourselves experiencing pain and suffering, we're not supposed to talk about it because that makes us less than men, etc., etc. And the disease goes merrily on. So, go ahead. And I, I don't mean to, you know, say goddamn kids these days, but it is it is kind of a generational change, and we've kind of seen it through, you know, as we get more and more people through the doors and out of schools. Um, it, you know, even even people that I came up through the the department with, you know, it's not the same as the people that we met when we got there and the people that we're seeing kind of come mm -hmm. in the door now. Um, and that's okay, there's nothing wrong with that, but we do have to kind of adapt and, and read the room a little bit to see who we're getting through the door so that we're not just forcing them back out if it's not handled properly. Erin, do you, do you see, um, not, 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 not necessarily just within your company, but um, just in your area in general, do you see that, a, is there still a stigma where people are afraid to talk because they're afraid it's going to, not so much that they don't want to get help, but they're worried about what it might do to their career or how people might perceive them? I think that is still an issue in some in some de depart, um, some types of emergency services. I think that's still kind of a question for police officers because of the nature of their work. Um, for us, there's not a whole lot of secondary factors if somebody does, you know, take a, a leave or as long as they're healthy and, and able to come back to work there's really not much um say, there's not a whole lot of secondary issues that that goes along with that um in some other 
emergency services, there might be a different thing. I'm not sure how it is in the fire service, but for you know EMS at least, it, there's not a lot of secondary issues. So people feel, I think, a little bit more comfortable. Um, there is still a little bit of a stigma because, you know, there there is a, a part of me that is still like, you know, we are emergency services. We are going to be dealing with crises and traumas. And, you know, you kind of have to have an idea of, of that when you come in. Um, but you don't necessarily know how it's going to affect you until it does. So you know what you know what you're going into. You kind of have an idea, but you're you're not necessarily sure how it's going to affect you. And I think people are now more comfortable saying, "I'm I'm not okay." And I think people in their in the outside world are more comfortable saying, "Hey, you're not the same that you were when you started this." So I think it's kind of a two-sided, um, or two sides to the same coin, I guess. You know, I think everybody is more attuned to being well and maintaining overall mental health awareness. So when they see somebody kind of changing or, or acting differently, they're a little bit more comfortable bringing it up than before. That's good to hear. Because yeah, it's, oh, yeah. you know, it's hard enough just admitting it to yourself. It's hard mm -hmm. enough to, to sometimes even just to say it out loud. So and who knows if that's something that, you know, we're ever going to get over. Um, but, but it's nice to hear that at least within the EMS community, it's, it's not as big of a factor. Um, it's not perfect. About your career. It, it's not perfect. And we, and we still have, you know, a lot of belief that this is your job. Suck it up, buttercup, and, and get in here. Get in the game. But, um, and, and. You know, again, you have to kind of read the room. You have to know who you're talking to. If somebody comes to you and they're saying that they're struggling, you have to know whether you have to know them well enough to appreciate that or to say, "Okay, I thank you for coming to me, but we got to work through this." And I think that that is kind of where we're at right now, just trying to figure out who you know, this job may not be for and who is really struggling and <clears throat> To, needs to help. That's that's a really good point. Um, I think what we see in military, law enforcement, and team firefighters is—I know this might not have been exactly what you're saying, but what, from what I'm what I'm hearing is it has a lot to do with leadership, knowing your people. You know, because what might be an emergency for one person, but something they can handle might be something another person just can't can't handle right. at all. And if you don't know your people, you know, you're not going to know if you're overreacting or underreacting. Because, I mean, how many times do you know, we hear stories about, I thought they were okay, you know? Well, yeah, to that end, we just lost two, for, two first responders within weeks of each other. Young men uh, with all kinds of promise, and uh, one was by suicide and one was by overdose. And the local EMS and, and uh, the local first responder community, community is reeling from this. And we've, I, I've been pretty busy in helping people deal with this and get them talking and so on and so forth. Yeah, and, and I think sometimes people, too, don't realize how resilient they, they are. And, you know, I certainly, as an 18-year-old kid coming through this, saw things that I didn't know that I would ever see, really, and um, it, it, it's, it, there were times when I had to grow a little bit from it, and I wouldn't say that it was easy all of the time, but, you know, I'm very grateful for the people that I did have supporting me, saying, you know, it'll be okay, there's always going to be another call, you can do it, and move forward. You know, if somebody gave me a hard time about it, I don't know that I would still be here. So I am grateful for the people that, you know, were supportive and I, you know, want to be supportive for other people coming through here as well. You'd really be amazed how, how, how far a kind word can go. Go ahead, Luis. No, definitely. I was good base to say the same thing. And then, um, I was going to ask Aaron, because um, y'all are touching on the question I wanted to ask a little bit earlier, but um, do you think that you said um, 
you know, this generation that's coming in now, it seems like they're a little bit more attuned to to speaking up and saying, hey, I'm not doing so well right now. Um, so do you feel that the older generation and yeah, that's us, our age, right? <laughs> <laughs> that it's us that are having the hard time speaking up about the, uh, the mental health because, and I ask that because that's what I found myself doing towards right before my suicide attempt um, was I was great about speaking about mental health and getting junior sailors the help they needed, but I would never speak up for myself. And so I bottled it. Do you see that kind of sort of the same way uh, in the EMS world for your firm or no, not so much? Um, I, I certainly, I certainly hope that anybody who is, at, you know, especially um, people who have been in the career for a while and kind of have seen a shift in things and, and a change, I'm, I'm hoping that they're going to feel comfortable enough that even if they, you know, didn't believe it coming through or, you know, kind of played tough up until this point, I, I hope that they're comfortable enough to, to say if they need help. Um, and again, I, I don't want to make it sound like, you know, it's kids these days or, you know, make it a generational thing, but I, I think that does play a part in it. And, that, you know, every generation that has come through can, can I think, relate to that. Um, but I, I, I'm hoping that in just discussing it and having people kind of come into the workforce who are comfortable saying, I need a break, I need a mental health day, whatever we're going to call it, um, to kind of normalize that. And, you know, as an administrator, it is um, hard sometimes to balance because, you know, in, in emergency services and, and in shift work in general, you somebody's got to be there. So I want people to be able to have time off. I want people to say, I need a day off, I need a break, I need a whatever. Um, but that also in, then kind of perpetuates this wheel of overworking people that are there and you know last minute changes to family functions because you got mandated to work or now you have to work a holiday because somebody's off. You know, It is kind of a, a vicious cycle and as an administrator, it's, it's hard to, to balance that. But, you know, I think if we take small steps to keep people well all of the time, they won't need to be out for long periods of time or, mm -hmm. you know, take a sudden, you know, wake up in the morning and go, I just cannot go to work today. You know, we, we don't, we want to try to avoid that as well. And it, it is going to take, it, it is going to take a long time or, you know, if I won the lottery tomorrow and I could hire 50 more people, it'd still not be enough to make sure that everybody got the time off that they, need, that they needed, you know. It, it's it's going to be a balance to kind of get people comfortable with saying when they need time off versus when they just don't want to, you know. Yeah, well, and, and I think that's where, um, like, resilience training really comes into effect, right? Mm -hmm. Because you have to learn how to be not only resilient, but also, um, like, harden your mind, right? Like know how to have proper tools in order to allow you to process you know whatever you might see uh you know out on a call that might affect you in a negative way for you to be able to process it in a positive healthy way so you can continue on with your work and or your mission whatever that you want to call it definitely and, and truth be told um resilience training and resilience that was the term that I only recently became familiar with. So that is something that I think is going to be a huge factor moving forward and just making sure that every, you know, and getting people trained with that because I, I didn't know what the hell it was. So, you know, if, if, right. not that I'm the be all end all, but if I didn't know what it was and I've kind of been, you know, playing around in this for a little while, I'm sure that most people don't either. So, right, right, yeah, yeah. And, um, and something I wanted to touch as well, because uh, we're talking about generations, right? Is um, yeah, for the the young, the younger viewers that are going to see this, uh, you know, and I can only speak for myself, but it seems like all of us four are in line with this. Is um, yeah, we don't mean nothing negative about it, you know. It in retro in, in other aspects, I should say, on the flip side of the coin, I've kind of started seeing that. Um, you know, our generation was the one, like you said, hey, suck it up, buttercup. You know, our parents were like, oh, you want to cry? I'll give you something to cry about, right? And 
we were just taught to like grit our teeth and bear down and, and go through it, right? And this generation is like, hold on, no, like y'all are all screwed up because you let your parents do that to y'all and your bosses do that to y'all. Like we're not gonna, you know. So I kind of see it as maybe their strength, right? Like them say, no, we are not, we're not standing up for this. We are not, you know, gonna allow this to happen again at our generation. So my point of view is like, to me, they're a little bit stronger than I was because I allowed the generational trauma, right, to continue. And they're saying, no, it stops here. So I hope that clarifies for our younger viewers. Like if we don't mean it in a bad way at all. No, um, no, some absolutely. of us do, some of us do actually see y'all as stronger than we were because y'all are stopping this. So that, that's that, that, that is setup. a very good, very good point. That, that, that leads me to a question, Aaron. Um, as an administrator, you know, I know you've got to balance, you know, the amount of time off you give somebody to recuperate when they need it. But then, because you don't have the option of shortening the days and you've only got so many people, what what kind of tools are there? I mean, when when you know that you can't put enough people back out there, or if, if you would have, I don't, not, maybe it hasn't happened yet, but if it were to happen, I mean, what, what options are there? Can you... Can you call in from other other localities to have them cover people's shifts, or, or is it just one of those things that's like, hey, we're short, there's no choice, you got to go out? Yeah, un unfortunately, we wouldn't be able to bring other people into staff. Um, you know, I still cover the field. Um, the other administrators still hop into the field frequently if we have to, when we have to. Um, so we kind of have that reserve, but even that is, you know, it, it's hard. You know, I, I still have a job to do, so it's hard for me to step away from that or and do that and be in the field. You know, it, there's always a, a ripple effect to it. Um, so, you know, when in the beginnings of COVID, when, you know, if you sneezed twice in a row, you had to be quarantined for 14 days. And, you know, we we did run into that and we, we were dropping units and dropping vehicles off the road and and that to the ripple effect point means that it's going to take longer to get an ambulance it's going to take longer god forbid you know a, 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 an emergency happens in your family there may not be an ambulance if we don't have the people to staff the crews um that has since gotten a lot better um but it, it was a, a concern during that time period um now what we're facing is hospital staffing shortages because they're also in, in crisis. Um, so we've got ambulances waiting in, in hospitals for up to two, three hours at times. Um, so not, now we've, now we're technically fully staffed, but our ambulances are tied up outside of the town waiting for um, hospital staff. So again, it's just, it's a, it's a vicious cycle of who's, who's short and you know what crisis we're dealing with and when there's fewer when there's fewer and fewer people to do the job we were talking about this before we went live um, I see it in my practice uh, my patients who are with uh, EMS police forces etc the line the colored lines are getting thinner and thinner all the time the thin red line the thin blue line etc etc and when there aren't enough people to to man an entire area and do the job, can you imagine what effect that has on fatigue, exhaustion, not fatigue, exhaustion, overwork, and mental health? That's something I was hoping you could jump in on, Aaron, for 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 tonight. Yeah, and and that's kind of that's that's the tip of the iceberg that we're at right now, and it's, it's yeah. going to be big and ugly and. Mm -hmm. I think the Titanic at some point, if we don't keep an eye on it. Um, I was concerned. About the, I was thinking of the same thing, Dr. Um, you know, it's, so I used to do manpower forecasting um, for the Marine Corps. And, you know, generally, if you can't increase your recruiting very quickly, the only other choice you have to try to bring more people in is start throwing money at the problem. But... The unintended consequence of that, right, is that you start burning people out or you start keeping people on because now they're doing it for the money because they need it. Yeah. So it's like, what is what is the right balance? You know, how do you, 
how do you determine how much how much of it is that there needs to be increased pay so it's still worth it or how much of it is how do you entice people to even consider the career field to begin with and you know I know that when budgets get cut you know and in municipal governments, it always seems to be fire, EMS, and police that gets cut first. And uh, I, I just, I, 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 and then the question, I guess, is an obvious question, but I'm like, what is the answer? Is how, how do you figure out, you know, how to do this when tools get taken away from you? And, you know, it, we, we saw the same thing in, in, in the Marine Corps with um, explosive ordnance disposal. You know, throw eighty thousand dollars at a twenty-two year old person and they'll stay. But to what end? You know? What does that do to that person when they do that two or three times? And yeah, I, I'm I'm very grateful for the administration. being working for any a municipal agency, I am very grateful for the administration that that we have now and that we've had. They've all been very supportive of, of public safety and emergency services. So I, I am grateful for that. Or, or selfishly for me, I guess. Um, but <laughs> uh, it, I personally believe that that really any human services job um, is time limited, and that has to that has to play a factor in it as well. I don't think that anybody should be dealing with crisis and and other human suffering for any prolonged period of time. I think 20 years is kind of, you know, the max as far as you get comfortable and and, and then it just gets too much. Um, the And, you know, we can we can pay people as much as they want. Again, if I had, if I won the lottery, I, I would, but I can't. And even if I did, when, when are they going to be done? Five years, 10 years, 20 years? You know, people that we're hiring now have to work until they're 62. You can't do this job until you're 62 if you start when you were my age, if you start in your 20s. You know, it, it it's not reasonable. It, it's it's just not feasible. So Not sustainable. You know, it's not. It's not. And um, that, that, that's exactly the word I was looking for. Thank you. <laughs> um, so it's, you know, I don't know if we throw money at it or we put a light at the end of the tunnel. You know, we, we kind of put, you know, this is a human services job. You're going to, you're going to, it's going to be hard. It's going to struggle, but it's time limited. If after that time period, you want to go and work at the library, you're more than welcome to. But, you know, to me, human services is, is a time limited career, regardless of whether it's police, fire, EMS, being a waitress, you know, food server, whatever, dealing with humans and humanity is time limited mm-hmm. for a lot of reasons. I always looked at throwing money at the problem as kind of like, think of the human brain as like an engine and you're only going to get so many miles out of it. And if you, know, if you want it to last until they turn 62, you can't be flooring it all the time. But if you start throwing money at the problem, you're going to wear it out much faster. Right. Well, if you yeah. want people to last in these kinds of fields, no, I, I, I'm going to disagree to a certain extent. I have heard some of the pay rates in EMS as being just terrible. The so-called yeah. market rate is a joke. It's an insult for, for the amount of stress and work that, work that these folks put in, which further compounds the problem. They have to work all kinds of extra shifts over time. We've got some of them like working in like two, maybe even three ambulance corps just to make ends meet. And they are cranking out. I, I, one guy I worked with held a completely straight face, and he told me, at his worst, he was doing over a hundred hours every week, for month after month after month. And boy, did he pay a catastrophic price for that. So, my idea of of some of of the solution, and I'll tell people this: make EMS or whatever part time have another job that is not EMS as an additional way to make ends meet. It's just adding a little variety because if all you're doing is EMS and all you're doing is hanging around EMS folks, that's, that's to me, those, those are the seeds of burnout. What do you think, Erin? Yeah. 
Um, I, I think people that choose this as a career really love doing it. I really love doing it. Um, I really enjoy the, the job, the work, the, the people, um, the skills. You know, I, I really love my job and I love being a parent. I love being a paramedic. I, I still, I still have another job, <laughs> you know, um, it, it is, it is very rewarding. And if, I don't want to say if you have the right perspective, but if you take it into perspective, you can really get a lot more out of it than, you know, it, it takes away from you. Um, I, and I, I was that EMS provider. I had many jobs. I made the paper one year because I worked so much overtime that I busted some record. I don't even remember it because I worked that many hours. Like, it was all just a blur. Um, but I used that time um, that paid for my bachelor's degree. So, again, it was a, it was a I'm going to work as much as I can in this amount of time so that I can get a, a higher education. Um, you know, you, you can make it work for you. But you also have to know when when to say when. You know, I I did that. I got my bachelor's degree. I got a promotion. I was very, again, very grateful for that. Um, and but I was exhausted, and I was, you know, it was it was it took a lot out of me. And you know, I finally got to the point where um, I had a lot of jobs, and I you know had a house that I would never saw. Um, and it it kind of made me sad a little bit. So I, you know, picked a day of the week and I picked something that I enjoyed doing, something that I had done since I was a child, which was, if you know me, Irish dance. If you couldn't tell by my name, I was very Irish. Um, so, you know, I picked that back. I went back to that as an adult. Um, I, you know, I said, I, I'm not working this day of the week any extra. And I went back to something that I enjoyed. And again, you, you, you can make this career work for you. And I think that everybody that chooses it loves helping and wants to help. And I think sometimes people get a little bit bogged down in the mess of it and lose sight of that. You know, if that's why you're in this job, because you want to help and you care about people, focus on that and, and do things that allow you to do that, but also do what you can so that you maintain that joy. Yeah, you got to survive today to, to be able to do it tomorrow, right? Right. It's a tiresome cliche, but what you guys are all talking about without using the word is the infamous work life balance. And it, it really it's what it boils down to because if if that's all you're doing is EMS or police or whatever, that those are the seeds of burnout. I worked with a cop for a number of years. And I think I've mentioned this in the presentation too. The the clinical jewels that these, these folks will give you along the way. He said, you know what I do at the end of my shift? Uh, hang up the badge, hang up the gun, I go home, and I don't hang out with other cops. He says, they're great to serve with, okay? When we got when we got a job to do, it's smooth sailing. You couldn't ask for it. But when we don't have a job to do and people start getting bored, you will never run into a more toxic bunch of chest thumpers. He says, I will not hang out with cops in my personal life. You know, this is how I get my own work-life balance. And that's, that seemed to, the idea of it, and I'm not a cop, but the basic, uh, the basic idea r resonated with me. And so I was hoping we could get a discussion going about that as well. Yeah, I can imagine with bad coping mechanisms, definitely want to be away from that. Mm -hmm. Codependency. That's the word we're looking for. I don't know. I've drank some cops under the table, so I mean, I can't have that. One of us has the worst coping mechanism. I couldn't be prouder of you. Yes, I've got the footage. Congratulations. <laughs> uh, no, and, you, it, you know what I'm talking true. about. I and and again, not to not to belabor the generational thing, but I think sometimes too, the generational of holy shit, that was a terrible day. I don't want to go home yet. Let's go have a drink and talk about it. I don't see that happening as much as it, as it used to. And, and I'm not saying that it was the right thing to do, but I, I think that that moment of, ooh, let's go get a drink and, and chat about that before we go home. You know, some that, that of kind of... What's that? Uh, some level of 
decompression or yeah, you know, yeah. releasing some of the stress. Right. Don't I, make a I, whole I, night out of it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Going for a drink is different than going out drinking, for sure. Um, but you know, I I do see a lot less of the um, socializing decompression kind of aspect of it like a lot of people just kind of hang up there and and i i get that like and not everybody wants to hang out with the you know i i had the same partner at work for you know six or seven years i saw him more than i saw anybody else ever you know he's he and i spent all of our time at work together which was over 40 hours a week so i get not wanting to do anything and everything outside of work with people that you work with um but i i do sometimes worry about that going away um, especially during COVID when you couldn't do anything like that. I do worry about people just going home and, and isolating or, you know, I don't, I don't know much about video games or stuff like that, but, you know, the whole not really connecting with reality when, you know, sometimes you have to deal with reality. I, I do kind of worry about that um, affecting resiliency, I guess, if that is inappropriate. <laughs> Okay. You know, I don't know that that's an appropriate form of, of resiliency or coping. It's kind of isolating and, and not being able to decompress with, with people that can relate to you. Yeah, no, that, that makes complete sense for me. Because it, it ties into something that that I've believed for a while. I haven't heard and talked about a lot. But, um, I, it's my personal opinion. I think that, at least on the military side, it's not about necessarily how well people cope with something or how much trauma they you know they experienced or, or witnessed I think it, I think it has a lot to do with how long it's been since they've been around other people who understand what you've been through because um, you'll see people that'll do a whole career not have any problems and shortly after they get out they cannot handle it and their reaction after a whole career isn't a whole lot different than somebody who just does four years and gets out and then finds out they can't handle it. And I, I think it, being able to be around those other people helps, you know, it grounds you to some extent and it's a constant release of some of that stress. And uh, so I could see that same thing. I, I can't imagine, I, I never thought about it. Um, like you said, you know, with COVID, okay, that's the end of the call. Everybody go home and, you know, hide in your dwelling now until this thing's over. That's, there's, there's no interaction, there's no human compassion going on with that. You know, at least in the same way that it did before. So I get that. What you're speaking to, um, as far as, is this all I, I, I'm ever going to do? And what am I going to turn it to at the end of my career? Uh, guys and gals who do like 30 years and don't have a work-life balance, and are married multiple times, and, 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 and. They are, I think, at higher risk for suicide when they finally hang up their badge or whatever. And there was a movie that came out in the early 70s. Uh, that would be the 1970s, not the 1870s, <laughs> starring the one and only George C. Scott. And it, the movie was The New Centurions. And it was a, a movie version of a Joseph Wamba book about life as a cop and George C. Scott plays this hard-bitten old training officer sergeant who had been at it for 30 years and George C. Scott just overwhelms the screen wherever he goes and whatever he does. For those who may or may not remember he played Patton so that that'll give you an idea of the intensity we're talking about as we all know. But in in that movie in the New Centurions after he retires, it's it's kind of implied within a few months, he doesn't know what to do with himself, so he swallows his gun. And that was a message that was put in the movie 50 years ago. How prophetic, how true, etc. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's a, this isn't a new thing. Every generation, I think, would like to believe that, you know, the version of, PTSD, trauma, stress that everybody's dealing with is new, but you know, look how many thousands of years we can look back and see people affected by it. That's so same problem, just different people or different generations. No, yeah, there's a talking about that. I think there's an excellent book out there called. Um, I actually have it. Oh, try, yeah, 
um, it's called tribe and it uh, it talks about in there like Native Americans and the Greeks um, would do it as well and just you know thousands of years back they actually saw this when their warriors would go out to battle and they would come home you know with PTSD battle fatigue whatever you want to call it right um, and so the elders in these you know different societies or civilizations I should say that were recognizing this saw it that once warriors came back from these battles that they were greeted with a great homecoming that they were you know also had the time to rest with their family have time by themselves with their family um, so it's something that you know us as human beings have recognized like you said Nate for thousands and thousands of years it's nothing new um, it, it just feels like either every every generation tries to reinvent the wheel or maybe the wheel for her for pizzas the and shit hasn't been invented right i don't know but yeah i don't think humans have evolved all that much really i mean to some extent we have but we don't you know our, our brains don't really like to deviate far from what what is the best thing what is the best case scenario and you know when you go to war or when you're dealing with other people's crises all the time. It, it's not what what we're programmed to do, even though we choose to do it because we want to help and, and we want to be there for our fellow humans. It's not really what we're programmed to do, and I don't think we've evolved from that yet. No, Erin, that's a great point that you brought up. I truly love that point um, about how we haven't really evolved from the beginning of maybe the existence of human beings. However, you whatever your belief is right i'm not going to you know go into that but however <laughs> you feel that we came about and we're here now um you know i, I believe that erin i believe that at the core of our soul of our heart you know we want to see love and compassion for everyone and when that gets disrupted however it, it is right through a, tra a traumatic event through responding to a traumatic event a combat you know trauma as a child whenever that gets disrupted our brain doesn't know how to process it because like you said we're not programmed to to have to see that trauma or that ugliness of life every day you know for like you said sometimes decades right so i i do think that you know again as humans we we survive and i think that is what we're programmed to do i don't know that we've um I think we're only kind of starting to understand, or at least I am anyway, that we can kind of choose how we get to survive. You know, not getting into, you know, super theological or life ethoses, but I was always kind of raised to believe, you know, the, the saying in our house was, this too shall pass. And, you know, you can, you can stay where you are or you can move with it, but it's going to pass and you have the choice of where that where you take it um everybody's got everybody's got shit and everybody's gone through some stuff and it's you you do you do have a, the choice and the the right to to go through it and and work through it but i don't believe that you have the right to kind of pass that on to other people so if you know you, you have gone through some stuff or you are going through some stuff you know you owe it to yourself to work through it and to fix it and to not kind of pass that on to other people um and and you know that that generational trauma or you know wh however we want to call it or however it applies you know you don't want to be the grumpy chief or you know in in doc scenario who's just raining angst on on the the rank and file you don't want to be the person who has 17 ex-wives and can't retire because their pension will be null and void. You know, you don't want to be that person. You don't want to, you, you don't, you owe yourself better to be better. And I, I think that that's kind of where the evolution is, is coming about now, you know, to own your shot, own your shit and, and deal with it. Don't, don't bring it to other people. Once you become aware of it, you're responsible for doing something about it, which is what I try to do in my practice. I point out the symptomology and whatnot. And when I did the old chief lecture, I've heard from so many people, they didn't even know they were 
they were that far up the creek until they saw that presentation and they say oh my god this is really me and it gets more dialogue going I did want to I did want to do a redirect uh, to something we were talking about before we before we went live um, with increasing frequency disturbingly increasing frequency on fire scenes and med scenes and whatnot uh, there is an increased amount of gunfire now we are doing a podcast with two individuals who know what gunfire is like they've been through it Luis and and Nate and I was just I was thinking it, it's hard to think of an emergency uh, of, 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 a, of a med call or a fire a fire call as being similar to a war zone but when you're fighting a fire and all of a sudden there some nut job is taking pot shots at you we <laughs> to a certain extent there's a little bit of warfare right here in our backyards and I'm wondering how people are dealing with that and if I'm overstating you guys let me know You know, well, you went you went through EMT class, and you know we kind of condition, we joke about it and say, you know, team safety, team safety, BSI, and everybody waves their hands and like they have their gloves on. And mm -hmm. It kind of ends up a joke by the end of it, but the goal is to train your brain to always go, always start there. You know, I, I do believe that humans don't give their intuition enough credit, um, and we're as we, you know grow we, we kind of dull that and sense that and it's okay it's fine everything's okay and, and you know it's probably not going to happen but i do believe that you know intuition plays a huge role in in survival and that is why we kind of train that lizard brain in emt school to always start at scene safety and go back to scene safety and if anything ever feels weird or funny or the mood changes back out um there, what's the old adage? It's better to be judged by twelve than carried by six. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, I don't. I don't know that a lot of people have faith in that adage as much anymore, given some 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 recent history. But you know, that that is kind of what we want people to think about: is that things change in a moment. And going back to perspective, this job gives you nothing but that perspective that anything can go wrong at any moment. You know, you pull up on a scene when somebody was out getting groceries and minding their own business and bam, they get into a car accident and somebody's dead. You know, things change in a moment and you have to be able to adapt and, and survive that. You know, the, the poor woman who was in, in New York City firefighter who was stabbed on her way to get lunch. Like, there's just, there's no reason for that. There's no logic for that. And that is how quickly things can change. And, and that is the state of affairs all of the time. Now we just see it on the news every night. And so hypervigilance is thought of as a symptom of post-traumatic stress disorder. But here we are making a case that maybe a little hypervigilance is actually a good thing. And BSI, basic scene safety, I remember, yes, that got pounded into our skulls too, and Erwin was one, doing, one of the ones doing the pounding. But also in fire police class, they said to us repeatedly, keep your head on a swivel. Keep your head on a swivel. So you're taught hypervigilance as a necessity. Well, there's a place for that, right? Right. <laughs> when, you're, when you're going on scene, it makes sense to do that there. I guess I would I would suggest that where it crosses the line to becoming a symptom is when you're doing it all the time. You know, eating breakfast at Waffle House, mm -hmm. sitting in a in a classroom. You know, that's that's when you know that it's it's gone. You, know, you haven't let go of it. And now it's yeah. become part of you. Not being <laughs> able to go to restaurants. Can I play devil's advocate. <laughs> well, oh, like hell you can. Well. Out of all my PTSD symptoms, the one I never want to ever go away is my hypervigilance. It doesn't, it doesn't keep me stuck in the house, but it makes me a lot more comfortable, especially when I'm out with my family, to be hypervigilant. It does. It's my comfort zone. It's, you know, it. To me, it's not a paralysis <laughs> thing. You know, it's it's my comfort zone. So out of anything, 
that I never want to lose from my PTSD is that hypervigilance. And I know it might sound crazy for, to some people, but it, it, it allows me to know that I'm safe, if that makes any sense. Well, it's the extent to which it goes. You know, a little bit of it all the time, sure. I, I've seen it in my, in, my, in my practice where it's crippling. And I, I have one guy who's got it true, so bad. The only, the only time he gets out, aside from going to the supermarket at 2 o'clock in the morning, is when he comes sees me because he cannot tolerate the outside world. I, 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 follow, I follow you completely, Louise. I understand what you're saying. Um, I know for, this is just 100% only me, but um, I didn't realize how much I was doing it until I had a service dog that was trained to face the opposite direction every time we stopped and to push me off to the side whenever somebody was approaching too quickly. And um, I realized that I wasn't exhausted by the end of the day like I used to be. Um, now, that just could be me. Maybe I was just like way you know, over. But it, was, it wasn't debilitating, but I realized how much stress for me was, was relieved when I wasn't doing it as much. But um, yeah, but I know I, I hear you. I don't. I, I'm still I'm still the same way, Luis. I'm like, um, like my boss wanted me to go to this uh, wanted me to go to this offsite meeting, and I'm like, we're doing it virtual too. I'm not going to go sit in this packed classroom and be stuck in the middle of somewhere, and you know can't pay attention because I'm spending my whole time wondering who is behind me. So I, I get you completely. <laughs> right, and then um. Talking about all of this as well, you know, pieces the and we were talking about a little bit coping earlier as, as well. I wanted just to um, kind of elaborate too, like, you know, we talk about coping, whether you're sitting, um, going out to vent with, you know, some friends after work, or you just sit at home and kind of isolate yourself. Um, I personally believe that any healthy coping mechanism can also turn into a very negative coping mechanism, right? So like we say, blowing off that steam, right? I mean, every time I picked up the drink to blow off some steam, it, my intent was one drink. <laughs> but after a while, right? After that coping mechanism of just having that one drink, for me, it was like, oh, it's taking the pain away. So for me, because of my alcoholism and my addictive personality, oh, I like this, right? So, well, a healthy coping mechanism, which turned from one drink and talking with friends and or the spouse, then led to a very negative coping mechanism with me being blacked out drunk. You know, and it could be with anything, you know, sex, eating, um, exercising, believe it or not. Uh, anything can turn into negative if it's done in excess. So, do you, do you see my that personal in, opinion. Um, I was just wondering, Aaron, do you see that in like, so in your career, have you seen that kind of manifest in people that maybe were having a hard time coping in a, in a healthy way where, I mean, we know drinking is the most common one, but you see where somebody s suddenly has a, a new uh, hobby that's become a very large portion of their life and they get focused on that. Sure. Yeah. And, by you something. Know, and, and, you know, present company excluded. I'm, I'm not innocent of, you know, having that one drink turn into way too many drinks, you know, from time to time. I, I, I acknowledge that I don't always have, you know, model the best coping mechanisms or the best coping skills. Um, but no, I do, I do completely agree with, you know, everything in, in kind of moderation. And as long as that what was healthy at one point um, doesn't become unhealthy. And I think too, you know, having multiple means of, of coping mechanisms or multiple coping mechanisms mm -hmm. and a lot of skills to, to draw from is, is very important, you know. It is good to have a routine and, and you know go to the gym in the morning and have a handful of friends that you trust and if you're you know having a bad day you can pull together and ha either have a drink or go to dinner or whatever um, or a hobby or you know whatever the case may be um, and, and and you know truth be told I, I do struggle with balance you know whether it's you know overextending myself and, and not being able to say no and, and wanting to do way more than than not that I'm capable of but then it's healthy to do, you know, that I, I can, I can definitely relate to that, that, you know, sometimes you go over and above just to avoid what needs to be done or what needs to be addressed. 
One of the things that I, I often wonder about is when when you have a medic or a firefighter or a, you know whomever turning in a 24 or 30 hour shift or working excessively throughout the week, setting all kinds of records and so on and so forth, at what point does the stress, the fatigue, the exhaustion start start eroding their abilities to the point where they're actually a liability? That's one thing that's always concerned me, like being a, a medical resident and turning in these 30, 40 hour shifts. How good are you at your job at the end of that 40 hour shift? You're not, you're not. And um, from experience and um, you know, the little story that I told you about making the paper, I stopped mm -hmm. working all those crazy hours when I made a stupid mistake because I was so exhausted. And, you know, no harm, no foul, but, you know, I, I made a stupid mistake and, and it was purely because I didn't know which end was up and I was exhausted. Um, I mean, I still worked extra just because, you know, I, I had a goal in mind, but I, I definitely checked myself and said, you know, you, you got to scale it back a little bit. And, you know, I, I know that there's studies out there and... Um, you know, after a 24 hour shift, you're cognitively intoxicated. You know, you can't pass the, the field sobriety test if, if they pulled you over driving. You know, that, that is a thing. You cannot be awake for 24 hours. You know, it, it's a form of torture. I don't have to tell you guys that, you know, sleep deprivation is a form of torture it, because of what it does to the brain. And, you know, I know that, you know, there's studies out there too that suicide ideation and suicide attempts go up with sleep deprivation you know that that that's all science that's all clinically proven so you know i per i personally um am not a big advocate for 24-hour shifts i only worked them very very scantily and only you know when i could plan for it um ahead of time to kind of adjust my schedule so that I, I had a little bit of recovery time, but it, it is not, it, it's just, I, I'm not a big proponent of them. I don't encourage people um, to do them. And I, I, we don't have a policy that says that you can't, but, you know, I, I go out of my way to never force anybody to work a 24 hour shift. If they can schedule it themselves or, you know, swap into it, whatever, and plan for it, fine. But, you know, I, I go above and, and beyond, and I stress that with the other field supervisors to not force anybody into doing any sort of marathon shift like that because it is a liability on, on us mm -hmm. and to them. So before we went before we went live, you know, I mentioned that I learn something new every single time we do this, and that was a new piece of yeah. information for me. I I have never I don't maybe I've heard it just didn't didn't remember it, but. I did not realize that as the sleep deprivation increases, that there's a, cor that there's a correlation that, to a suicide as well. That's mm -hmm. Even the dog agrees with you. Sorry. It's funny as I was hearing that in the headphones and I kept looking at my dogs <laughs> trying to figure out where it's coming from. <laughs> That's great. Hi, Gracie. I, was, I wanted to go back to something that was um, that we touched on a little bit, and um, Dr. Fonseca was had mentioned. Luis had, was getting to it, and it made me think about something you said earlier, um, Aaron, about what what is the what's the retirement age, or what, what's the first retirement age where you're at? Um, so we're in the New York State retirement system, which again is is a blessing. Because you know some commercial agencies and other agent and other agencies who are not in a, a municipal service don't have that option. Um, when I was hired, we were tier four, so the earliest that I can retire is when I'm 55. And when I'm 55, having started, um, and I had some previous. I was a summer camp counselor, so I had started in the retirement system from when I was 16, 15, 16. Um, so. You know, by the time that I'm eligible to retire at 55, I will have almost 35 years of service credit in the retirement system. 
which is, again, is... a mixed blessing. I will have to retire because there will be no more benefits to be had <laughs> to stay any longer. But, you know, I, that's, well, that's a luxury that I'm afforded. And, you know. Yeah, I mean, it, at some point, <laughs> everybody reaches zero benefit, right? If you, <laughs> if you don't stop working. <laughs> And after right. 35 years of this, Aaron, you're going to be balder than I am. God bless you. <laughs> the reason I brought that up is it's just like that kind of blew me away because I remember, you know, when I was 18 years old, the idea of somebody doing 20 years in the military just seemed, you know, so far away. It's like I'm not even going to look, look at that as a goal. I can't imagine trying to bring somebody into a career field that's going to wear them out, you know, physically and mentally and tell them, Hey, but you're going to do this until you're 55 if you want to retire or even 62 and a half. I mean, at that point, your life expectancy is only about, I think it's, I think it's 83. Once you hit 55, your expectancy is like to 83. But Unless I, you've served in emergency like services and then it's cut by like a third. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, it's, um, so what I'm thinking about is, Doc talking about the you know the old chief. On the military side, there's a lot of veterans nonprofits that are um, doing these rites of passages um, to bring people back to the civilian world, you know, to, to being non-military. Um, a friend of ours, um, or the, saw a friend that we've made recently, uh, Frederick Marx has got a film series on it called Veterans um, Journey Home. But is there anything like that for you know for EMT, law enforcement, fire, and stuff like that to help people reintegrate when they're leaving that profession to reintegrate to being just a regular person again? Um, honestly, not that I'm aware of. That, that is an interesting uh, notion. I I think to because a lot of people do retire from emergency, you know, from EMS or emergency services. Um, a lot of people, and you know, this is kind of what where we're at right now, um, leave us to go and either become a firefighter or a police officer or something else in the municipal retirement system with uh, a 20 or 25 year retirement cutoff. You know, that they they have that that light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. They'll come and work for us for a couple years and then you know leave to go there so that they can retire early. Um, a lot of people in the fire service um, do have other jobs or, or, or um, have a, tr a trade, or, or, you know, so they're electricians or plumbers or contractors or whatever. So they do have outside work that when they do hit their 20 years and retire, they can go to and kind of just have a second career almost. Um, a lot of people will retire from EMS and then go and teach. Um, either they'll retire from EMS because they have to, you know, from an injury or whatever other uh, reason, financial reason, it doesn't pick your, pick your poison. Um, but a lot of people leave and, yeah. and go to teach um, because it is more of a sustainable profession and they can do that in, into their 50s and 60s without the physical labor and the mental anguish exhaustion factor. So we do lose a lot of people before retirement age to other professions. And the ones that do retire from EMS um, or emergency services in general tend to go to another profession after that. I remember somebody, Aaron, you and I both know, I won't mention names, during during EMT training said, emergency med EMS is a great place to start your career but a terrible place to end it. And I think you know who I'm talking about. But briefly, I, I will say I have occasionally seen somebody out there who has put in 30 years or, God forbid, more on an ambulance. Talk about the thousand-yard stare. I swear to you guys, it, can, it, it, it exists for folks like that as well, as well as combat vets. This guy, the one I, I'm thinking of, it's a, it's an expression I'll never forget. He had seen too much. Well, that's that's kind of one of the things I was thinking about is that person who stays on that and does nothing but that, or or something very similar to it. It's like when you when you hang up, you know, when you hang up your hat and you decide to retire. Thirty five years of doing emergency services. 
I can imagine that that's got to be a hard adjustment to, you know, then before maybe you were an electrician and emergency services, but now the emergency services part is gone, but you've done that for so long. I, I wonder how, much, how that adjustment works for them to be you know, just an electrician, you know, then do the other, because I would imagine they would have a lot of the same thoughts, you know, that vets have, is like, these people have no idea what I've been through or what I've seen, or they don't have any idea what a hard day is because they've only done this. And I wonder how much adjustment, how many adjustment issues there are for people who do that long term as well. I, well, that's honestly, not a believer. Like, like you shouldn't compare, you know, your struggles to somebody else. Or like, does that make sense? Because you can always find somebody that either has it better than you or harder than you. You know, you could always play woe is me. You know, and um, and I would always tell people. When they ask me, especially now, I've been retired a little bit over a year now, and they're like, Luis, you had such a smooth, easy transition into being a civilian. How did you make it? Like, you know, I'm, I'm struggling. Um, and I tell them, I was like, because my identity wasn't hung up on, I'm a Navy corpsman, and that's all I know. Like, no, like, I very well knew that one day I was going to take off that uniform for good. Um, and when I was getting ready to retire, because... At that time, I've done so much work on my mental health, and I shared this with you gentlemen before, um, Aaron, is what I say is um, part of my retirement that made me so happy about getting ready to retire was I finally got the opportunity to rediscover, not reinvent, but rediscover who Luis Fonseca was before he joined the military. And all of those dreams, all of those, you know, wanting, to, that's why people are like, Luis, what are you doing with your life? I'm like, I'm enjoying it. I've graduated from HVAC school since I retired. I'm in welding school right now. I've started two nonprofit organizations. And it's all out of just enjoyment because I knew that H1 Fonseca wasn't all encompassing of Luis Fonseca. You know, that was just a, a part of the puzzle piece of every, of who makes me who I am. You know, and I think people that have that hard transition in any profession, right, is because they get hung up on this is who I am. I've been a doctor for 30 years. I've been a professor for 40 years. You know, I've been a scientist for this long. I've been a, you know, a corpsman, a, a military person or whatever, right? And it's like, but that's not your whole identity. That's just a portion of who you are. Uh, and, and that's just my personal opinion and belief, right? So, I don't yeah. know. I, I do think that's very important. And, you know, I, I, in this, in the, in the next generation of people coming in now and, and you know, I, I think that they're a little bit better at that um, than, than certainly I was for a long time. Um, you know, I, I mentioned kind of going back to what made me happy when, you know, I, I had the opportunity to and, you know, it sounds strange to be 37 and um, thinking that, you know, thinking about my, I know I said it, I didn't, I, I did, I didn't have to, you, you didn't have to do the math now, I, I said it. Um, <laughs> But thinking about, you know, all right, all do? right, all right. All right, Aaron, here, here's what you're fishing for. Yes, you preserve very well. You went to the <laughs> Dick Clark School of Aging. I couldn't be happier for you. Well done. Thanks. Now that I got that out of your system. <laughs> um, but, you know, it, it is it is kind of strange to, to be thinking now, you know, when I do turn 55 and I can retire that's that's still really young and I and I I have a lot of you know I can still do something so in doing what I love you know my goal now is to get my teaching certificate from Ireland to be certified to teach Irish dance and then be a judge and you know have somebody else pay the bill for my travel and travel around on somebody else's time you know so it is it is kind of a weird thing to think about but I, I think it is important to think about to not tie your identity up with what what am I going to do now? You know, have 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 an idea, and if it if you can make it work, do it. Well, everybody should be happy that I didn't go back to what I did before I was in the Marine Corps. <laughs> As a yeah, I'd be incarcerated. <laughs> Same. <laughs> I've had a lot of people express extra concern about what I do 
And <laughs> I, from their perspective, I, I can understand it because you guys know me reasonably well by now. If m my wife were in this room right now, she says, this isn't what he does. This is who he is. And I can't turn off the doctor. And no, do I have to with, okay after this? Just invite me over to do another lecture. We'll call it even. Make me an honorary member of Colony. We'll call it even. Have the dog sit all over my lap for another hour and wash my face. We'll call it even. Anyway. Um, mwah. <laughs> but it, yeah, it's it's something I, I've been told I, I really need to watch because I don't, people are worried, and you guys have said it, you know, aren't you worried about burning out, how much, how this affects you? At least for now, I, the way I explain it to people is, and Nate and Luis laugh when I'm, when I, when I do these podcasts, when I do like eight, 10, 12 sessions in my practice, I am wired. I'm like, more, I want more. <laughs> and, and these guys are wiped by the time these things are done and my colleagues, say, but it's just, it's when I'm, everything is firing on all cylinders. Every synapse is aware. And this is when the world makes sense is when I'm staring down the barrel of the human condition, you know, up to my eyebrows and pathology all day long. To each well, his I own. I, yeah, but I think like, and don't get me wrong, for the 22 years that I served in the Navy, it, yes, it was a love-hate relationship, all right? But I truly loved being a sailor. I, I loved being a corpsman. I loved teaching. Aaron, like you said, like right now what you're doing, you know, teaching, right? That's what you're looking at. I love teaching and passing down that knowledge to the younger generation, right? Um, but I, I think, like with you, Doc Barry, it's like a, a passionate thing. It's, and it's like with Nate and, and me and, and, and Aaron, like we talk about mental health as well now too because it's a passion for us. It, it's, you know, like you throughout stages of our life, we, we might have different passions and or um, goals that we want to achieve, right? And um, I see it maybe Doc Barry is like, this has just been your passion your whole life. You know what I mean? Like since you went to school and, and college and that's what mm -hmm. fuels you. The Navy was my passion for a long time until I generally got burned out, until I generally started seeing the the misleading of men and women. I'm trying to get away from a lot of negative <laughs> bashing of leadership. I can totally um, relate so to that's that, why. Being but you know, like all, when I just started seeing how little at the same time, effect you know, I had on leadership the, and the, how we the led people, because you, get from, you know, there's you know, people that got paid a lot more money to stroke that right pen, there, you know, right? And their signature problem, meant a lot more than my that little, is, but down at the the the, the deck plate level, right? And excitement, um, and, you know, so I think like with you, it's like more out of, out of a passion. Kind of I'm not saying that, you know, and, and, me, and even still, you know, teaching EMT classes. Leaving the Navy or, you know, was because I lost my passion for it, but uh, maybe I'm just rambling. But it's kind of like I said, like, you know, I knew I was going to hang up my hat and, and the military life of me was going to be gone. And in my mind, I wanted to walk away and have nothing to do with the Navy or, or the military ever again. But I didn't and I kind of can't you know does that make sense I just don't have to wear the uniform now you know I but know, I'm still so very embedded with the Navy I mean I still get called to go speak in front of sailors and leadership on how we can do better in leading uh, you know men and women in, in in our profession and how you know we can deal with mental health and all that stuff so it's Maybe it's the same thing, Doc Barry. It's just I just don't wear the uniform anymore. Like I just never left the service. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, Luis, you left you left the bureaucracy behind, but you didn't leave the sailors behind. Yeah. True. True. You can take the sailor out of the navy. You can take the sailor out of the navy, but you can't take the navy out of the sailor. And as usual, we've been at this now for over two hours, and I could see the discussion going on for an additional two or even longer. Um, and we're gonna have to wrap so it up for tonight. Two. Yeah, and and that's the thing, Aaron. I mean, should you ever want to sign yourself in for another bout of this intimacy torture thing, love to have you back. Um, speaking for my, I've had a blast. Um, 
and uh, and let's do it again, please. Yes, please. Thank you, Aaron, so much for your time this evening. I really do appreciate it. Mm-hmm. But yeah, but thanks for for coming on. And yeah, some great perspectives with your experience. All right, everyone. All right. Well, have a great evening, Phoenix. Say bye bye to everyone. Bye bye, Phoenix. Good night, Grace. Good night, Grace. Good night, Aaron.